Hi, Joy. Hi. Nice to see you. Good to be here. And I, I believe uh, uh, congratulations are in order. This AR piece we're talking about, East of the Rockies, won an award at the 360 Film Festival in Paris for Plan Commune. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that later, but what does it mean to you to win an international award like this? Uh, well, what does it mean? It means I'm, I'm so flabbergasted by this that I can hardly believe it. <laughs> that it um, I mean, I thought... It, uh, if it's even recognized in Canada. I mean, I, I don't know what it is, but anyway, there it is. It's uh, just completely amazing to me, and I'm really, really happy about it. I can tell. When did you first find out about augmented reality? Were you aware of it before East of the Rockies? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still not really. It's just <laughs> what was it that appealed to you about working on something like this? Though? Well, um, I didn't know what I was doing, really. And usually I find out what I'm doing after I've done it, you know. So um, my writing is like that. I write and then I find out later what I've written. So, <laughs> well, What do you mean by that? Um, well, I, I live my life with trust. That is that... Whatever it is that's ahead of you, you don't really know. I mean, we don't really know what's happening in the world, mm -hmm. and we think we do. But there is too much that's unpredictable and unknown. So in terms of, I mean, this is what I've discovered about my writing, is that uh, the pen acts independently of any volition on my part, and it then reveals to me, and later on to whoever else reads this, what it says. So I learned by hindsight. The eyes are in the back of my head. So when it came to this project, East of the Rockies, mm -hmm. it's exactly like that. I didn't know what I was doing. You just knew you were going to write a story about this time, uh, about this person, about yeah, this time in your life. It's, and, and, it's, and it's sort of like that. I'm, I met these two guys, and they were talking about something I did not know anything about. And I thought, well, why not? <laughs> and then that's how it started. Did it feel any different to you writing this big, you know, odd technology, augmented reality technology? Did it feel any different than writing anything else? Absolutely. It was totally different. Oh, yeah? In that um, when you're uh, in charge and you've got the pen in your hand and there's nothing else except you and the piece of paper and the pen, then... Um, you scribble away, you don't know what you've done, you look at it and then you think, oh, that's not quite right, and you change it and you keep on changing it all the way through the whole process. If it's a poem, it's really quick. If it's a novel, it's really long. I didn't know what this was, but what I found is that if I put something down or I thought about something, boom, there it was. And, you know, there were too many other people involved in this whole thing so that whatever I changed was really upsetting to others who had already got started thinking about, you know, what is this? So the process was altogether different because it was collaborative and other people had their say, and I had to let it go a lot, much more than I do with writing. So, so let's talk about East of the Rockies. First off, that's that's a, an expression that you, you heard growing up, right? Tell, yes, tell I me, did. Tell me yeah. what that means. Um, well, we were told after the Second World War that we had two choices. One, we could um, choose to uh, go to a foreign country, which is Japan, mm -hmm. which most of us had never been to, or we could go east of the Rockies, that is, out of B.C., and, um, you know, be in another part of the country the country. And there was a dispersal policy going on, which was to make sure we didn't go home, go back to where we came from in BC, but because um, all those things had been destroyed for us or taken away from us. And uh, so we were scattered entirely across the country. So, that was, so we went east of the Rockies. So this story in the east of the Rockies, the AR sort of piece we're talking about right now, Yuki, I mentioned Yuki, a 17-year-old girl who was forced to live in an internment camp during the Second World War. You mentioned the east of the Rockies is something that you heard growing up in, in your own experiences. How much of Yuki's story is similar to your story? Well, it's similar in the geography. We were in Vancouver as a family. We went to Slocan as a family, and then to um, east of the Rockies to southern Alberta. Um, and then from there, I came to Toronto. So it, um, it, it has that geography. But the age range of the storytelling is different because I was a much younger child. 
And um, so, you know, when I was six years old, no, there's a 17-year-old I mm. have to enter and become and see what's happening to her. So that was fictional, of course. If, you, if you're just tuning in, I'm speaking to the Canadian poet and novelist Joy Kagawa. Jo, Joy wrote the script for East of the Rockies, which is a narrative augmented reality experience that tells the story of the persecution and internment of Japanese Canadians during the Second World War. East of the Rockies is an app that you can download on your phone or tablet, or you can go see it at the Toronto Real Asian Festival, which is on right now. So through this app, we learn um, some of the objects that Yuki and her family bring with them to the internment camp, like books, mm -hmm. books and music. What do, what do you remember about what your family brought? Well, y you know, we, um, I, I think in many ways we are privileged. Um, and other people didn't weren't able to take quite as much as we did, I think. But um, so so I can remember, you know, the the books. Um, as I I had just been to grade one, and so I got my grade two reader, which I practically memorized. And so I remember things like like that. I mean that that was the world that I inhabited. Most of the kids, I mean, there was no school at first for the first year. And so when we went to school for the second year that the sc a school was built and so on, um, uh, so most kids were held back for a year, but I had had these mm. few books that I had and treasured and read and reread and memorized practically. And I think those were the source for me of values and um, the love of words. In, in in the book, sorry, in the in the um, artificial reality experience in East of the Rockies, you can actually touch the books. You can actually touch the records that Yuki brings with her, the the the, 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 the objects that folks bring with themselves to, to the internment camps. And you said something really interesting earlier. You were talking. I said, "How different is it to write a novel versus yeah. write this thing?" And you said, "Well, there's so many more people involved, but also then when you write it." There it is. And I wonder whether the experience of being able to touch and feel things in the camps was, was interesting to you as a writer who normally has to deal with kind of just the mind yeah. when they're writing. Well, of course, I didn't know about all that that was going on in, in some other part of that whole domain. And um, so it was very interesting when I began to see, I was uh, went into one session where there were actors all connected up with things, uh, electrodes all over them, and their movements then were being captured, and those movements were part of the storytelling. I, uh, you know, it's a, how, how that was all happening. Mm -hmm. So the thing was um, being developed by, by others who were creating the the scenery and everything else. Yeah, I, I don't understand it either, to be <laughs> honest. I don't, I don't really get it. But what I do understand is that it's an opportunity for people to feel perhaps more intensely yeah. what, what it was like, don't you think? Uh, that's possible, but although I think that the reading part of um, getting to feel is, is very internal and I think in many ways superior, but then fewer people are reading. Right. So then they need another medium to be able to enter mm -hmm. um, other people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, but the imagination is in a way um, captured for them, and so I, I think it's really important for people to have the freedom of their imaginations and to go beyond even AR and to use their imaginations in actual people and being able to interact and know this story in uh, a current reality. I think what's important really is for any work of art, if it's of any value, to transform your life. Mm -hmm. So that's the question of it. You know, how relevant is it to the world that we've got today? You know, the us and them world, the enemy is not us. That's the thing that needs to be overcome. And uh, so you wonder, if will it help to do that? If it does, then it's amazing. What, what, speaking of making things modern and making things you know, present in 2019, I can't, I can't help but notice that your grandchild, Anne, mm -hmm. uh, does the voice for Yuki in, in this project. Yes. What, what, does that, what does that mean to you? It, that is completely thrilling, too. There's so many thrilling things about this whole thing. Um, she's an extraordinary child. She's not a child, obviously. She's a university student. And um, she just came over here from BC. She's at UBC. 
and um, sat down in front of a mic and read the narrative in two days. And so there was, you know, no many takes or anything like that. It was just straight out. Mm -hmm. And so that takes a lot of talent. And so I was very proud of her. Well, but what is that like for them to... Uh for them to be speaking an experience that they are generations away from, but is still part of their part of their history that you experience, that must be meaningful for for you to, to to watch them do that. Right, that that sense of being able to to connect with another generation uh, about one's own life—that's a tremendous privilege. I think it, in many ways, skipped a generation um, because um, the my generation, which is the second the, the generation that was born in Canada. Um, by and large, the trauma of the dispersal, even more than the trauma of the uprooting, the initial uprooting, um, w went so deeply inside of us, and there was such shame and um, wishing it not to be so, and wanting to imbibe the culture that had been foisted upon us, which was that we had to be the only Jap in town. So you, you know, you didn't talk about anything that was Japanesey, and you walked away from that identity so thoroughly. And here is Anne at the end of this story saying, okay, so that's a choice you made. I don't know how much of a choice it was because it was imposed, but she opts for another choice. And uh, so I think that this is why, you know, you wonder why when the zero tolerance net goes through the trying to find the enemy and then they think they've got the enemy when they've got the enemy and the enemy's relatives and everybody else in there in that big net, that mm -hmm. zero tolerance net. It's killing off the best thing because in the, the generations change and they remember and they change. And they learn. Yes, and they have something to offer. So, you know, I wonder about this habit that we have of not being able to see um, we just don't see at all. What we don't see is that the enemy is really not the enemy. That's what we don't see, and that's what we need to see. Um, Ken Adachi wrote a book, The Enemy That Never Was. That's the identity of every single human being. We're not the enemy. If you know somebody really thoroughly enough, you will love them fully. Mm -hmm. So we need to overcome the us and them, and I hope this story can do that a bit. I'm, 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 it's, it's, it's certainly a big step. It's a, it's, I've, I found it very affecting to be able to kind of step into this world uh, virtually. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to Q. I'm speaking with Joy Kagawa, who's best known for her book Obasan, which was published in 1981. Obasan, one of the first novels to recount the story of Japanese persecution and internment in Canada. A passage from Obasan was read out in the House of Commons during the Canadian government's apology in September 1988 for the wrongs it committed against Japanese Canadians during the Second World War. Um, here's a, a clip of that. The fact is, I never got used to it, and I cannot. I cannot bear the memory. There are some nightmares from which there is no waking. That's Ed Broadbent, the former leader of the NDP, reading an excerpt of Obasan in the House of Commons uh, 31 years later. Yeah. I see you sort of wincing. <laughs> you, you know what happened the other day on um, October 5? We had an event. Um, I belong to a group called Japanese Canadians for Social Justice, and we had this event where we were able to say thank you to the people that stood with us, and Ed Broadbent was there. Oh, wow. And, uh, so he, you know, so, so it, I was finally able to say to him thank you for that mm -hmm. stupendous moment. It was so stupefying. And, uh, what, what do you remember feeling in that moment when, when that well, happened? It was, uh, it was sort of like the, this award thing, you know, it's sort of so you sort of scratch your head and it seems so unreal and it seems so amazingly wonderful that part of you actually, when it's an extreme emotion like that, you go numb. Mm. And so that's what happened to me. I was numb. But then with that kind of good numbness comes a very long memory. And so it's one of those things I'll never forget because of how shocking it was to see that. I mean, what? You know, Ed Robbins reading my book? Really? Is that true? How can it be? It was sort of so numbing. And it's like that for this award in Paris. Mm -hmm. And I, it, it, so I'll remember. I, I think about, I think about, we, we were talking about this a little bit early, is that 
in a lot of schools back where I'm from and all across the country, uh, Obasan is part of uh, the high school curriculum. Mm-hmm. I remember studying it when I was doing uh, AP English in, in at Holy Heart in, in St. John's, Newfoundland, you know, uh-huh. very far away from BC. But, you know, and there yeah. I was. And, and that's that's such a I was talking to Margaret Atwood about this yesterday, is that that's such a tender age for people to be reading things, things they read when they're 15, 16, 17, right. stay with them forever. Yeah. So I have a two part question. One is what does it mean for that book to be taught in schools and for you know generations at that that important age to be to be reading your your experience yeah well that's another one of those things you know that yeah. seems so sort of slightly unreal mm-hmm. um and um just sort of i i'm all right here's the thing um this journey of this life has been through these horrible things but there has been so much to be grateful for and and i think that's another thing we need in our world is that sense of, wow, we're so lucky. We're lucky that we're these animals with this kind of consciousness. And so if you're filled up with that gratitude, even if this is the time of the sixth extinction, if that's where we're in, and we're still seeing each other as enemies and we're not going to get over that because it's so deep in us, because mm. we haven't developed morally. Mm. Um, so. Yeah, well, I forget what your question was, but at any rate, what I'm saying is that, um, yeah, it is it is a sense of gratitude that I have overwhelmingly. But it leads me to the second part of my question, which is that, I mean, a, a whole new generation of young people are going to be interacting with East of the Rockies now yeah. through their uh, iPads and through their iPhones. Yeah. Not just what does that mean to you, which is an immense sense of gratitude, but what do you hope they take from it? What do you hope people across this country take from using it? Well, um, I mean, we, we, I mean, this is a story about one family and one young woman and her life. And it's not everybody's life. But if we can all examine our own very unique lives and know that whatever story it is that anybody has, it really, really matters. Not just the whole, the entire life, but the very minutest aspect of that life, which is the thought that you have at any moment. I think we have no idea of the impact of who and what we are on in, as, as existing beings and what our capacities are. I, I, what I think is that we're tremendously powerful and don't know it, like the atom. It's this tiny invisible thing that you don't even know about, and yet it can destroy. And so I think that a single thought can save the universe, can save the planet, which means that every tiny thing matters, like I'm thinking about save our drinking water one cigarette butt at a time, you know Mm -hmm. what I'm wanting Mm -hmm. to say? Watch where your ash goes, it's going into our drinking water, it's Mm -hmm. a thought. Mm -hmm. But if people would do that, it would make such a difference. So I'm thinking, how do we energize people to know how incredibly important we each are, not just our lives, but our thoughts. Our thoughts are so important. Joy, Joy, it's been such a pleasure speaking to you. (laughs) Well, thank you. It's been great to be here.